welcome to where the furniture isn't always the best, but the views, they are amazing. Miami Hurricane family, and those of you who just want to support a black business, today we introduce Dr. Camille Cohen of Dr. Camille Cohen Optometrist and Associates Park Slope. Dr. Cohen's practice is comprised of a dedicated team of eye care experts that provide you and your family the highest quality eye care experience. Located inside Pearl Vision, the practice specializes in comprehensive eye exams, contact lens fitting, and the treatment and management of eye disease and eye infections. For more information, get your pens out. Visit https semicolon forward slash forward slash eyedoctors.pearlvision.com forward slash ny forward slash Brooklyn forward slash nine five hyphen seventh hyphen av dot html. For hashtag buy Black Friday, Dr. Camille Cohen and Associates Park Slope will give away Ray-Ban non-prescription sunglasses. Simply tag an alumnus for an entry into the giveaway. In the meantime, all alumni can take advantage of 20% off the purchase of glasses or contacts. And now to our show. What's happening? Welcome to the 13th Floor Podcast, the podcast devoted to giving you first row access to the minds of the successful Black man. I am your host, B. Jones. Brett, I got almost the whole team with me tonight. Coach K is here. Art, what's happening? BJ, what's going on? Uh, we here. We excited. <laughs> we got a lot to get into. So as Art brings everybody into the room, Hey. There we go. What's happening? What's happening? Dry, dry run, ladies and gentlemen. Don't kill us on the YouTube. Uh, before we get into this uh, thing too heavily, I want to make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Uh, make sure you like us. Uh, wherever you're listening to us at, subscribe. Uh, you can catch this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, everywhere podcasts are played. And make sure you check us out on the social media at 134, please. Um, and as you listen... Leave us those comments, leave us the reviews. We've had some excellent feedback over the last couple of weeks and we appreciate it, we're here for it. We always love engaging with our listeners, our viewers and the community. So um, yeah, stay connected with us. Fellas, y'all good? Y'all ready to get into this thing? Yeah, we good, man. And hey, we got a Perfect. shout out. Um, and I don't, I don't know if any of you all know who this is, but hold on one second. Let me, uh, we got a new comment. Um, and it's from from uh, Kamaya Farrell, and she says oh, that yeah. she loves this platform and what it offers. Shout out to Kamaya! Nice. I appreciate that. Yeah, who's Kamaya? <laughs> so Kamaya is a good friend of mine. She's in California. She's in San Diego. So shout out to the West Coast, Ooh. reaching over across. Yeah, man. Nice. Um, yeah. Big big shout out. There it is. There it is. Um, so I want to get into. We got a, a lot to get into tonight let's do it um first things first (laughs) (laughs) y'all heard uh, i'm sure y'all have heard by now that omar arbery burger um guilty federal charges uh, for federal hate crime for all three gentlemen um how do y'all feel what's the impact how y'all feelings on that go ahead bj it's a it's a mixed bag right because i i i the system in this case proved that they they heard the facts, they decided which way it, it needed to go, and they made a decision. Now I'm I still cringe a little when I I hear people say I'm glad they they got it right or glad like people are they have emotion because finally a verdict came back that gave justice somebody who had wrongdoing done to them like. Just thinking about, I mean, I think you think you put skin color in it, you put race, ethnicity, all the backgrounds is a hate crime, right? Um, they found right, but when you still have a community to say, "Who?" or "I'm glad," or that just that the justice system finally did the right thing, it's still a slap in the face in some ways, right? So okay. I, I'm, I'm the return verdict was the way it should have been, I believe. But again, when you still look at our society as a whole and People just sitting on pins and needles waiting for that to say was was normally what they normally say. Or if it came back the other way, 
and I'm not, um, I'm surprised, but I'm not shocked or vice versa, whichever way you say it, right? So it's one of the things where the system did its job, but this is one case out of many that have gone by who have not gotten justice for their son, for their family member, for their community. So again, a tally in the win column, but we still got a long way to go. So it's, before you go, Carol, because I know you got like this whole prolific thing. No, what you I just don't, said. Go ahead. <laughs> what you just said, BJ, about it being a tally in the win column is the only thing that I, I typically take offense to. Um, because I don't I don't feel like there's any winning in this type of situation. Um, I think the justice system finally, you know, worked and justice was served for the family um on and on both ends, right? But when you talk about winning, you still have a mother that's lost their son. Uh, we still living in a time where you can't even, we can't get meaningful legislation pushed forward on a state or federal level to curtail some of this nonsense with the police, um, police and community interaction. Um, and these are, these are vigilantes. These weren't even police. Um, right. So I think that that also plays a little bit more into, I think, why the verdict kind of came back the way it did um, as well, even though I think one of them was like an ex-police officer or retired. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm real careful how I, I look at it as far as a win um, until I can see something that's results that are more lasting um, versus, you know, this particular instance in time where we can celebrate the justice system, you know, actually doing right by us, but I feel like justice was served and that's kind of where it, where it ends for me. I, I think there's still more work and a lot more uh, of an outcome to be gained. Totally agree. I, I don't, before Kay goes, I don't have anything. Why, why is everybody scared to go after me? I'm not going after you. I'm, I'm literally saying I had no, I've been so busy at work today. I didn't notice it or hear about anything. <laughs> And my timeline has been, I, it's not in my timeline or any notification, so I've been lost. So I'm going to be kind of a, I'm going to pull a BJ in this section and jump in and add some good comments. Um, but I, I am looking forward to, uh, to, to the, the final <laughs> conversation <laughs> from the coach. <laughs> I, I, all I was going to say was that it, it's, look, you got life sentences on top of life sentences that part is a win that, you know, justice was served. However, was justice learned? Was justice taught? You still have the local sheriff. You still have the, you know, local prosecutors. Uh, did they go through some type of training? Did they get some type of education? How many other things have gone on that they've just let go by? And because it wasn't in the public eye, nothing was done. It's so, almost got let go. Yes. I think those, and absolutely. I don't know if those same individuals mm. are still in office or. I don't know either. Yeah, it did. But, but that's the question. It's not a win unless we have corrected and made sure that nothing like this will happen again. And are there some cases that need to go be dug in, dug in, dug into Definitely, to yeah. understand what has happened in the past? I'm sure there, there probably are. And you got to take hmm. into consideration. So one of the first points I had this afternoon conversation at work actually was with some coworkers was that thinking through how much of a limelight this case was, was that a factor on either jury's mind, whether it was the initial verdict or the, the federal case verdict? Like if we don't return this verdict back this way, what is the repercussions of it? Like, if I remember correctly, I, I still have to look up. There was no minority or one minority on the initial case. I'm not sure about this la the federal case right now, how many there were jurors. Um, so you think about people who are thinking about, hypothetically, they can be thinking about the repercussion, the neighborhoods, the city as a whole, instead of just, doing justice because justice was needed to be served 
were there other factors in this? We would never know, right? There's certain things that about that we would never know, but there, there, there are other conversations and thoughts that are a part of this whole process. They play out in this whole thing. So do you necessarily feel like that's a bad thing? Um, I understand the, the morality of it, right? But I think that consequences breed certain types of action, right? So when we understand, let's take the case of, uh, we can go all the way back to 1963 in Megar Evers' case, a jury of all white folks, two times mistrial, right? And at that point in time, you know you're not gonna get a guilty verdict and this just happened to be a hung jury or whatnot. And no, no real repercussions because at that time you have a heightened aggression, white folks pretty much, uh, black folks live in a lot, a lot of fear and have to deal with a lot more pressure. Now where we have a lot more rights, a lot more power, whether or not we organize and yield it, wield it as we should, it's another conversation, but now, especially coming off of the heels of George Floyd's case and a lot of, of the other cases that did not go in the direction that we wanted them to go as far as justice being served when it comes to black men dying, black women dying, et cetera. Is it such a bad thing for the people on the jury or the prosecution or the judges to know that there will be consequences if this thing doesn't go in a just manner? Deep down, I believe so. I believe that, that there are there's there's some negative repercussions from that. Yes, initially, no. Long term, when people look at the case and when they look at what happened, is it a false sense of progress? A false sense of hope? A false sense of gaining traction? Okay. For the sake of the saving the from the fallout. Again, some of the things we would never know, but I do think there there could be some detriment to that being the underlying case. Like I want deep down, I, and I know it's not the case, but I want to believe that justice was served because everybody felt that it was the right thing to do. And the evidence point, there was no way of giving out. Even I even heard like the defense, um, the defense attorney yesterday before they wrapped up or whatever was just like basically got up in a short amount of time, didn't call any witnesses or call like one witness or, and like basically the prosecution didn't prove beyond a shadow of doubt, find him, find him innocent and then sat down. Wow. <laughs> like they, they thought like they, they were just gonna win the case. It was really no long, long drawn out ses session. They didn't really go and call all these witnesses to rebu rebuttal and all that stuff. They didn't do all that stuff. Man. Well, I guess in this situation too, it, it's it's kind of hard to to defend what we we we're actually able to see, you know. And, and when you look at some of the facts around in the case, it's like, what is a prosecutor going to do when they've already been found guilty in the in the lesser court? So for the uh, I guess the criminal court or criminal case, um, they've already been found guilty. So when you get to the federal case right. of hate crimes, you know, you basically trying the case all over again. I don't know that they, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to get up there like um, uh, Chauvin's lawyer and, you know, <laughs> throw, was... throw darts in the dark and, you know, make a fool of yourself or, you know, you're just kind of going to, you, you're going to eat it. I guess it could go either way. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, that, that, whole, that whole piece of the legal strategy is not my thing. I I see, I kind of listen to what's going on. That's not my Forte, I think that's a good question to ask if we ever go down a path about the justice system and what happens in cases and the way people try cases, like as we move forward, and that may be a, a thing to talk to somebody later on about. Um, but I'd be happy to, to, to engage in that conversation more because I'm really interested in it. Like, I don't know. But Long term, I think if that was if that's the underlying reason why people make decisions, it's still short selling um the overall verdict and and what sense of progress people think or hope they have in the system 
then that I can I can honestly think then that if I can if I have that doubt in my head, then the system the system is screwed up regardless. That's not a question. We're not we're not learning, we're not improving at all. Okay. I'm looking at you, Carol. You look like you was about to say something, so I I I keep it. I keep it going. Well, I, I I'm just kind of wondering if do we think about all this that it it came this way because the first case was pretty much cut and dry, and this one is like just for formality. Um, and two, I don't know what this will change. I'm hoping this will change something and it will make a difference. Um, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've heard in the, in, the, in the legal system that that because once it go even because this is a federal case now it's a federal case and the hate crime is the charge right like technically yes the world knows what happened there mm -hmm. but they have like Brett said they have to try the case all over again you have to you can't bring that into it and say well we won this we okay. proved that here you have to start all over again and the the the, the burden of proof um, now it shifts towards proving that it was a hate crime, not this a crime was committed. It was a hate crime. So there has to be a whole bunch of, again, I'm not into the legal pieces of that stuff, but I know that part is a total different thing that you have to prove. So, and Kay said this before, he says earlier, uh, uh, back on the um, Black History Month um, podcast about, I think it may have been afterwards, but everyone has a protective class. A hate crime puts all of us in this big weird box, but then there's specific crimes against you no know, Asians, specific crimes against Jewish. Do you think at this point now that there might possibly be some kind of protective class just for you know black, African American, brown skin uh, people, or is or is do you think this may help that process go forward, or is just no they're going to stay in the, in the hate crime category, hate crime category? No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think there are enough cases for there to be set precedent at this point for them to automatically say, oh, this is going to be open and shut. You did this, you're going to be guilty. I think this is just one of those things where people are going to say, oh, you got caught. And think of ways not to get caught if they want to do it. Right. Wow. Okay. <laughs> we're not even go we're not even going to get into the I think it's millions of black and brown people that are missing in this country. Mm. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. We're done here on the 13th floor where the furniture isn't always the best, but the few are amazing. amazing.